have a chance to uh, introduce themselves? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, uh, mm-hmm. I think we can like start to yeah. start to introduce my, uh, ourselves. Yeah, we have, we have well, six, six minutes more, six more minutes. Yeah, to... yeah. Yeah, so we officially start at 10, uh, 310. And yeah. I will start to introduce myself like, in case people don't know me. And uh, I'm Jen, and uh, I will be uh, I will be starting my postdoc uh, at Max Planck Institute for Intelligent System in October. And uh, I just graduated from McGill University, and uh, as a PhD, and uh, my research direction is on um, uh, bio-inspired structures, solid mechanics, and uh, intelligent structures. Yeah. Shimi. Hi, yeah. Hey. Hey, hello everyone. So my name is Shimin. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I have known Jen for for a long time. Actually, we have known for for a very long time. Yeah. And then uh, now I'm a postdoc at uh, UCLA, and I will be a uh, assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong uh, at the end of this year. So my research is focused on the um, organic bioelectronics for biomedical applications. Yeah. Thank you. How about being me yourself? Okay, so brief introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Bing Bing Yi, and uh, I'm currently a um, PhD candidate at McGill University, and also an uh, exchange PhD student at the University of Toronto. My research area is uh, about uh, wearable electronics and soft robotics, and also microfluidics biosensors. Uh, yeah, that's it. about our host, Bing? Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, so it's supposed to be that uh, Injun introduced me, but <laughs> I think it's better that introduce yeah, myself. Yeah. I, mean, I will introduce in like uh, more details <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> I know my I know myself with more details. Um, so <laughs> my name is Bing Guo. Uh, I graduated from McGill University in civil and environmental engineering, and uh, my research area is environmental microbiology and microbiology. And then I uh, I joined uh, University of Alberta and uh, TU Delft as a postdoc uh, researcher. So uh, I built a uh, collaboration project uh, between the two universities. And I, uh, I actually officially joined uh, the University of uh, Surrey in UK as a lecturer, which is the level of um, uh, assistant professor as in North America. So I have already started online, like remotely. And hopefully I can move in about one month. Um, yeah, nice to meet everyone here. Congrats. Thank you. So we we still have three minutes left and uh, I will just like uh, briefly, very briefly introduce uh, the society and we are currently building. And uh, so like uh, this is the Marketing Society and uh, we are focusing on um, uh, uh, for young scholars to share their thoughts and to promote interdisciplinary exchange. And what's more importantly, to help us build connections and make friends. So we currently have TMS talk and TMS workshop and WBA talk, which focus on uh, the world beyond academia. Um, and uh, so if you have any questions, like, uh, or you want to be a host, or you want to be a speaker, please send an email or subscribe to our WeChat channel, WeChat channels. Yeah. So yeah, we have two minutes left and I will, uh, briefly introduce today's uh, guest speakers and uh, our guest host. So today's talk will be on faith and detection of human viruses in the urban water cycles by uh, Dr. Yin Ye. And uh, so we also invited our honored guest host, uh, Dr. Bing Guo. And uh, uh, she is a lecturer at the University of Surrey, uh, working, on, uh, working on the field of uh, environmental microbiology she was a joint postdoc fellow at University of Alberta and uh, Delft University of Technology in Netherlands. And uh, she received her PhD and a master's degree at McGill University and a bachelor's degree from uh, Beijing Normal University of, uh, in, in China. So, uh, so now, like, uh, uh, Bing, how about you introduce a bit uh, uh, 
introduce about our honored guest speaker, uh, Dr. Dr. Ye. So you, you, uh, you, you are very familiar with her work. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Yin Ye and have her as our uh, speaker today. Uh, so Dr. Yin Ye graduated from uh, Tongji University, like a one of the top environmental field um, universities in China. And uh, then she graduated from University of uh, Michigan in uh, 2018 as a uh, PhD. After that, uh, she joined the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory as a postdoc researcher. And uh, she obtained a position in the Department of Civil, Structural and Environmental mm -hmm. Engineering at the Uni University of Buffalo as an assistant professor. Um, she will start in January next year, and uh, uh, she hoped to recruit student, new students in the field of uh, virus detection during water, water treatments or other related environmental processes. Uh, so if anyone knows any uh, other persons or you are interested in um, applying as a master or PhD student with her, you can contact contact her after the talk and also we would like to because um we we, we share uh similar like not i'm not in the virus field but in microbiology so we hope that we can be connected to more uh researchers in the similar field because um we found that it's hard that to 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 find someone to find someone um related to our field in North America, <laughs> at least for now, it's, it's not a lot. So we are happy to, con uh, to be connected. And uh, Dr. Ye, um, Dr. Yin, uh, Yin Ye has uh, extensive uh, research experience in virus detection in uh, water treatment processes and modeling. So uh, let's welcome Dr. Ye to speak today. Yeah. So I will give my screen to Dr. Ye so uh, she mm -hmm. can share her fantastic work with us. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, please um, go ahead. All the time is yours. Yeah. Okay, I can do that. <clears throat> can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, we can see. Thank you. Thank you, Bing and Jen, for such great opportunity uh, to let me talk about the virus, which I think is quite relevant to our current situation about the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so I'm an engineer. I'm really uh, focusing on the wastewater and drinking water treatment <clears throat> and then try to remove and inactivate those infectious human viruses in the water systems. So I hope my today's talk would uh, answer some of your questions about the virus in water and also alleviate, alleviate, some, alleviate some of your concerns about uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the urban water cycle. And so you can follow my Twitter or send my emails uh, to further discussion. Okay, so when we track back the human history, the viral infections are actually are not uh, uh, it's occurred super early around the 1000 BC. So you can see this is an Egyptian steel that portrayed a person with a crypt leg. So this is a similar symptom that caused by poliovirus infection. And then, so you might be out of our modern science and technology, but I would tell you that um, in the human history, there's only one virus that uh, has been successfully eradicated from the planet. It's called smallpox virus, and Chinese name is Tianhua. Uh, Tianhua. Uh, um, <clears throat> we we nearly achieving the eradication of poliovirus. But um, there are still two countries have a polio pandemic right now. So the original thought, uh, the original plan is to eradicate it in two, uh, 2019, but now the WHO extended uh, to the four years later to 2023. We will see if we can eradicate the second virus from the planet. 
um, in most of the cases that the virus actually coexists or co-evolve with human beings. Uh, for example, the, in 1918, you may heard about the word Spanish flu. Um, it's the global pandemic of influenza viruses. And then later on, we had seasonal flu and because the virus being mutated every year and then it outbreak every, uh, during winter time. And then you may also heard about Ebola virus because we had an a outbreak in 2015. Um, this virus was actually first identified in 1976 and then the later on they will have several cases each year and then after uh, for every several years it will have the outbreak. Um, for today we're also talking about the coronavirus uh, if you're at my age and uh, we we all be experienced that the, the SARS coronavirus pandemic in 2003. And then we also later on, there's a MERS coronavirus outbreak. And for this year, it's a huge, uh, severe global pandemic of SARS CoV 2, uh, the SARS CoV 2 virus in, uh, in the world. Uh, for today, I was just using these uh, two types of virus polio virus uh, and then the SARS, uh, the, the coronavirus as the two examples to show you how uh, these viruses get into the urban water cycle and how our engineers trying to understand the fate of the virus and how to treat and activate these viruses in our water systems. And I will also touch a little bit about for those unknown and the future viruses and how we should be better prepared for the future pandemic. Um, so a little bit background of polio virus. So this virus, um, we first had a polio outbreak um, in the US in 1894. So these, uh, these, so the first people found is some like people get um, paralyzed because for, uh, for some reasons. And then this virus were identified, was identified six years later, and then we found it's caused by virus and they, then they named it as polio virus. Um, at that time, we still don't know how this virus gets in, transmitted. And then, so it's not, it's not very good to control the spreading of the viruses. And then in the following years, the polio virus gets spread out all over the, uh, the globe and then causing a lot of death and it paralyzes. Um, until like you can see about almost 50, several years later, we got the vaccine. Um, during these years, the oral polio vaccines were licensed and then we start app uh, applying those vaccination uh, for most of the population in the world. And in 1988, we start the eradication initiative, trying to say we want to eradicate the polio from the globe. Uh, but until the 2020, I checked the most updated um, data that there are still two countries in the world, uh, and they still have the uh, wild type polio uh, endemic in the, in, the, in the countries, and the Afghanistan, Pakistan. So it's still, we still need to continue the vaccination and moving the eradication forward. So the polio virus, um, for a virus, they actually, they're mutated. So for polio, they have basically three types uh, for the wild polio viruses. They will have type one, two, and three. For two and three, we already eradicated uh, in 2015 and 19, but uh, right now it's based in most of the circulating cases were caused by the wild, uh, wild polio type one. And then there's also some like um, vaccine derived polio virus outbreaks, which because it's caused by the vaccine strain of the polio viruses. But uh, this is not a big concern because the vaccine strain will, uh, will not cause very uh, severe diseases, and then it can be well controlled if most of the most of the population can be applied the vaccination. And for the polio virus, uh, the infectious viruses will be shed 
in the stools of, from, and from the infected individuals. So the transmission route is basically from the fecal oral routes. So if you, uh, if you touch any uh, fecal contaminated surface or water, uh, you can easily get the polio infection. <clears throat> and then for polio virus, most of the population, like 75%, they are asymptomatic infections. Uh, only 25%, they have some flu-like symptoms. And one out of 200 people will get, infected people will get paralyzed. And it's a really contagious virus, but right now we, we're really, we control this virus really well. Um, and then for the coronavirus, it's, uh, so in 2003, we first encountered really deadly pandemic strain of uh, uh, coronavirus we call SARS. And in later years, we have MERS. And this year, the COVID-19, I just checked the data, the COVID-19 cost already almost 20 million infected cases and then almost 1 million deaths. Um, so for these three strains that start, these three type uh, strains, SARS coronavirus, uh, co coronavirus, MERS, corona, and SARS CoV-2, these viruses are really uh, will cause very severe disease. But you may not know um, that I would tell you there are actually, there are four coronaviruses circulating in human, um, but they cause really mild infections, especially in children, and they cause the diarrhea, some common cold symptoms. The death rate's really low, uh, but for these three special cases, they will have very uh, deadly consequences. So coronavirus is known be, uh, for the respiratory route transmission. So through the very close contact uh, that the respiratory droplets, and then people also found may, and these virus can also be transmitted through the aerosols or through the wastewater, but uh, it's re uh, really rare. For SARS-CoV-2, um, because even though like 50% of patients will shed the virus in their feces, um, but the infectious particles uh, were hardly isolated. Um, one study found um, they were successfully isolating infectious SARS-CoV-2 virus from those people with really severe COVID-19, suggesting that the infectious particle shedding is actually um, not really high frequencies, um, but you would find a lot of uh, genes um, in their feces, but that doesn't mean they're infectious. So for these two viruses, they're quite, so virus has a very simple, have very simple structure, but these two cor coronavirus and poliovirus, they have very different molecular composition. For poliovirus, and also like other, you may heard about norovirus, noru bindu, uh, they're, non-envelope virus, we call non-envelope because um, they consist of uh, protein capsids and with genome. Um, viral genome are really diverse. They can be RNA or DNA, uh, single-stranded or double-stranded or segmented genome, a lot of type of ge genomes. Uh, for coronavirus, we call, it, we call coronaviruses enveloped viruses because they contain an external a lipid membrane outside of uh, their genome and protein capsids. So the, because they have different structures, um, but our previous studies primarily focused on the polio virus because um, it's causing a lot of troubles um, in the non-envelope viruses. We know much less about envelope viruses. So that's my PhD work focusing trying to understand what's the fate and how we can inactivate those envelope viruses in wastewater if any infectious particles are present. Uh, for, for today, I would just combine these two together, uh, give you really uh, common knowledge and about how our current knowledge about the, 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 those two type of viruses in water systems. So, when the patients 
get a, uh, acquired, acquired the viral infections, and they shed those in infectious viruses in their stool or urine, and then we are flushing the toilet, and it gets into the sewer systems, and then they combine the sewer system will combine the entire community and transport to wastewater treatment plant. So it is important to inactivate any infectious viruses in wastewater and in order to avoid contamination of the downstream water systems. And it's also important for drinking water systems, oh, for water, uh, drinking water systems, it's also important to apply the virus inactivation because it's direct, you drink the water directly. Um, so that's how the viruses get uh, circulated, uh, enter the urban water cycle, and then, uh, and how our engineer uh, need to better control the spreading of the viruses. For today, I would first talking about two concepts that um, are kind of two major work that we uh, really, focused on. So one is we wanted to know uh, what's the ability, uh, how, uh, what's the survivability of the viruses in the wastewater. So we define Can, can, can everyone hear? Is it? I think it's a frozen. I think it's freezing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I will contact you to see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Find the survivability as the untied virus and as so that we can enact reducing their infectivity. Can everyone hear me clearly? Okay, so yeah, yeah, first, yeah. Okay. Oh, first okay. Like looking at the survivability, um, the ability to retain infectivity. Uh, I would have first introduced to you how we test the virus infectivity. Uh, in order to know whether or not the virus is infectious or not, we needed, uh, we needed to using the whole cells. So basically the cells were the cells were obtained from uh, monkey or human uh, tissues. And then those cells, and then we apply the viruses to the cells and to see whether the virus can infect the cell, replicate and elise the cell. So if the virus were able to do the infections and if the finally will elise the cells, in most cases, you can, in some cases, you can see that the virus would clear uh, some uh, the, the monolayer of the cell lines. You will see some clear spots. Um, and then when you're counting, so we're assuming one clear spot represent one infectious virus caused by one infectious virus. So you're just uh, counting how many, uh, how many clear spots here and then calculating back the concentration of the infectious viruses. And for these, we call it a plaque assay. And then in some, in some other cases, the virus cannot, uh, even though they lyse the cells, but they're not causing really clear um, um, plaques. Uh, in those cases, we would add in some of fluorescent dyes binding to some of the viral proteins to visualize the virus replicating in cells. And for those assays, we call focus forming assay. So these are two basic, uh, very commonly used, um, used assays to quantify the virus infectivity. Uh, but for these assays, uh, there are a lot of limitations actually. Um, you needed to culture the viruses for several days or weeks in order to see those plaques and to have the virus replicating. So it take a long time. Uh, and also, like uh, bacteria, uh, we know thousands, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of bacteria, but we can only culture a small portion, like uh, a few viruses, 
by using the cell lines in the lab. So, uh, but the good thing is most of the dangerous viruses like uh, COVID-19, like SARS-CoV-2 and the Ebola virus, you were able to using the cell line to culture them. But even though we can culture them, we were not able to do this dangerous culturing in our lab for engineering, as I'm in the School of Engineering, um, we can only do viruses that are not that dangerous. Uh, so they have four levels of biosafety, uh, called biosafety levels. And then for engineering school labs, you can easily get certified for BSL-2, that's the highest. So you can do BSL-1 or 2 viruses in the lab. But for SARS, for SARS, uh, SARS coronavirus and also Ebola virus, they're really dangerous. So they're BSL three or four. So these viruses, um, and then these labs regulation are really sensitive, and then it's not really possible to do. Um, so we got some limitations, but we still wanted to know how those dangerous viruses survive in our wastewater. What we do is we use some model viruses. So we try to pick a lot of different viruses that are not, not that dangerous uh, we can work with in the lab and try to represent similar structures and the similar genomes like, the vi like our target viruses. So for, our, so for my study, I wanted to know the coronavirus. So I picked um, two envelope of virus, both have the lipid structures. So I used the mouse coronavirus. <clears throat> so this only infects the mouse cell lines, not the human. And I also used the one bacterial virus called a 5-6. So these two viruses, I try to use them as a model for my coronavirus. And then for other non-envelope viruses like a polio or a norovirus, I use the E. coli virus. <clears throat> uh, so I use all these four viruses and try to get some understanding of how the non-envelope and envelope viruses survive in wastewater. Um, to test the infectivity, we grab wastewater samples and we add in all of the viruses in wastewater. We test it at two different temperatures, try to uh, mimic the winter and the summer temperature of the, uh, the wastewater. Uh, we check in the infectivity of our model viruses by the plaque assay to see how the infectivity change throughout the time. So for here, I will show you under two different temperatures um, how this survivability look like. So the y-axis uh, is the log 10 values. So we always uh, normalize to the initial concentration versus the time that the, the virus were, uh, were incubated in the wastewater. So under 25 degree, oh, so for all the blue dots here represents the envelope coronavirus model. And then those orange, orange data is like, is the non-enveloped, uh, like polio and then norovirus models. So you can see it's, for those envelope virus, they uh, inactivated way faster than the non-enveloped virus models. But if you go to the lower temperature, um, the envelope virus inactivation became much slower. Um, okay, okay. So we were really um, thinking of, so this is 24 hours uh, because for virus, when you shed into, when you flush in the toilets and then it normally takes less than 24 hours for the wastewater gets into the wastewater treatment plant. So we really want to know uh, how much virus can be activated uh, within the 24 hours. So here, the data is showing um, less than one log occurred uh, for the coronavirus, uh, for the envelope virus under 10 degrees C, suggesting there might be some infectious envelope viruses gets into the wastewater. But it really depends on how much uh, initial concentration that you have. Um, so 
if the virus, if, if the infectious virus can get into the wastewater, and then the next one is to think about what are the disinfection methods that we can apply to better uh, inactivate those viruses. Um, again, um, the way to test it is to use the models. Um, we can do, <clears throat> we can apply the, uh, the disinfectants and to the virus and then using the plaque assay to measure their in fact, in activation, in, to measure their inactivity. Uh, so to see how effective the disinfectants could uh, reduce the infectivity of viruses. Um, but the issue with such assays, because um, you're using really limited model, so that, that's the issue of the model. So the viruses, uh, when they reacting with those disinfectants, they're actually they're quite diverse in their structure, in their amino, in their protein structures, in their genome types. So it's really hard to predict or get a general ideas of of uh, whether or not the the method would work for a specific type of viruses. Um, and then our idea is try to think of, try to build the correlation. So for the virus inactivation, so we inactivate the viruses, we're actually um, having the reactions occurring in the virus genome proteins and their, or lipids. So we want to find some correlation, see if we can find um, some features that uh, on the virus particles, we can linking that back to their infectivity. So the goal is try to think of if we can't, so not, um, let me think, so not most of, not very, uh, many of the viruses are not culturable. And then, so we want to say if we can find um, the molecular features on the genome, protein, and lipids, uh, see we can better assess uh, which of the disinfection methods could uh, work to re uh, inactivate those viruses. So uh, then we try, we did um, a, to prove our concept, we use a uh, uh, use an envelope model virus, and then we uh, so these viruses uh, I introduced before it's five six, and um, it's really similar. I have segmented genome, and then it's. This a little bit different from uh, it's a fr different from the coronavirus, but we just wanted to see if we can testing any molecular features that know how the virus inactivated. So we used the two different um, inactivation methods to test the virus inactivation. So the first is we used a uh, free chlorine, uh, which is also very common used in the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, for we first apply the plaque assays to test um, how these two um, to calculate it, how the virus um, inactivation kinetics look like, and then we take in the samples um, to do to looking at the reaction kinetics for their genome, protein, and lipids. So for uh, for genomes, we uh, in order to test the, the the genome reaction kinetics, we used a, a reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, we call it RT-qPCR. So basically, we so this method uh, we do the genome extraction, and then we denature their double strand RNA genome into a single strand RNA, and then we apply the reverse uh, transcriptase, it's a enzyme, and it could uh, convert the RNA into the DNA. And then once you got the, we got the DNA, we would uh, do the polymerase chain reaction to amplify um, the target DNA and to get, so based on the standard curves, we can calculate it back with the gene copies concentration of the stock. 
So if the virus is inactivated and we would expect the genome get damaged, so we got the signals, uh, we got the concentration decreasing throughout the treatment. So, by, uh, so that's the way we do the uh, genome detection. And then for the lipids detection, we using we do lipid extraction um, and then looking at their um, their lipids by uh, by using um, the liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. So this you will see all the peaks eluded, and based on the peak areas, you're able to calculate how much lipids were reacted. Uh, for the protein, for the protein uh, kinetics tracking, we also use um, the tandem mass spectrometry. But for here, we uh, generated an internal standards by uh, by labeling the virus with uh, uh, nitrogen fifteen, so that they have mass differences. In a, ten, in a mass spectrometry, you, you were able to find a pair um, of the, for the light peptides and the heavy peptides um, with the different mass, so that the axis is the mass differences. So you can always find these pairs and calculating the ratio of the light to heavy as a way to quantify how much uh, peptides in the light forms were reacted with the free chlorine. So we apply all these technologies and techniques to looking at the genome protein and lipids. So for genomes, uh, this black bar here is to tell you how fast the virus inactivate uh, to reduce their infectivity. So for the genome, they're actually not react as fast as, fast as the virus inactivation. And again, for the lipids, we also didn't detect any changing of the lipid, uh, the lipid contents, suggesting that these two may not drive uh, the virus inactivation. And different stories in the virus proteins and peptides. So for we, we are not looking at the intact protein directly. We're looking at those small peptides. So we, cut, we chop the proteins into small pieces. And for those small pieces, uh, we each bar represent the peptide that we detected uh, from the virus. And then there, you can see there are several bars that are really high, suggesting these peptides are degraded after the virus reacting with the free chlorine. And then when we compare these bars, their kinetics with the in fact, inactivation kinetics, we found they're really correlated and the suggesting that the protein or the peptide reactions uh, somehow may drive uh, the phi 6 inactivation. And then this is how the, the protein located in the virus. So we found that the P3 protein reacted very fast, their peptides reacting very fast, and also P1 protein, and also their P2 protein that really capsided it, um, suggesting that the free chlorine can trans somehow like easily cross the membrane and gets into uh, reacting with the, uh, with the protein. Um, okay. And then we also looking, comparing um, the phi 6 virus with MS2 virus, which they have very different inactivation kinetics. So the phi 6 can be easily inactivated by free chlorine, but MS2 is not that easy uh, to inactivate by free chlorine. Because uh, we found that protein reactions might be the really critical reasons to drive the differences. So we compare their uh, peptide reactivity with the free chlorine for those two viruses. You can see that the phi 6 peptides are at, um, as we expected, re react really faster uh, with the free chlorine compared to MS2 peptides. And when we're looking at some of the protein structures and doing some simulation about, um, so we looking at uh, methionine amino acids, 
which is a amino acid that can be easily oxidized. That no, uh, we do we did a uh, solvent accessible area simulation to see how these methionine exposed to the uh, to the chlorine solution, and so this is how this um, methionine in a 5-6 protein look like. They're quite exposed, suggesting it can be easily attacked by the free chlorine molecules. But for MS2, when we did the simulation, you can see these um, methionine um, side chains are actually really um, buried due to the folding structure of the MS2 protein. Um, and then, so we, we think that, so we conclude that they might be due to the exposed amino acids in the 5-6 protein that these viruses are so easily to be activated. Um, and we then we later also apply the UV-254 with the similar methods and techniques and I found that for UV-254, we know that it's only target the genome. That's a, the, exactly what we found from our results. So for you, when, when you're treating the virus with UV-254, um, you can simply measure how the genome damaged um, to assess the infectivity reduction. Uh, so to summarize these two methods and um, the mechanisms of virus activation, so for free chlorine, uh, if in, if for in the future, if a new virus coming out, we can see if the virus protein have any um, have any exposed uh, amino acids. So we can think of maybe if they have the exposed amino, oxid amino acids that can be easily oxidized, these viruses might be really susceptible to the free chlorine treatment. And for the, free, uh, for the virus, uh, new viruses, we can look at how their genome uh, reacting with the UV254 as a way to assess uh, how the UV254 can reduce their in infectivity. Um, but we need a other further work to better understanding the correlation of the protein damage and in, and, and, and inactivation. Um, so, okay, so for, for these two parts, I would say uh, these are actually two main focus for water treatment about viruses. Uh, congratulations, uh, you all have very basic knowledge about that. Um, and I may use a little bit of time to talking about the detection method, because um, it's also very important to, especially when new virus is coming out, whether or not we can uh, better monitor those viruses in our systems to, uh, to better evaluate uh, the, the treating of the, the water, the processes. So for a current method, just summarize some of the methods that I already mentioned before. So we have the cell cultures to testing the infectious human viruses. Uh, we also have the PCR or RT-PCR RT methods, um, but they are looking at the genome. So by just by looking at the genome, you don't know the infectivity, okay? Um, <clears throat> and then we also have the genome sequencing method. Um, for this method, again, any methods like only targeting the genome, uh, you would not able to know their infectivity. Um, so, People also integrate some cell culture assay with the PCR. So as long as the PCR can detect, that means the virus can replicate in, in the cell cultures. Uh, so these are basic for commonly used methods to testing the virus in the environmental samples. But the issue with the PCR, they require a lot of uh, uh, method optimization. And then if the genome mutated for the virus, which is easily occur, uh, the PCR may fail, uh, so you may not know the virus that you are detect. You may not detect the viruses. Um, so, and also for PCR, it's not easy to do a multi multi multiplexed 
PCR assay. Uh, so normally we do, we only target one piece of genes in per PCR reaction. Um, so that's the most commonly used method. So we need, because um, there are a lot of virus circulating in our systems, we definitely want to have the assay that we can do multiple virus detection. That would really help uh, to, uh, with the engineering system. Um, so then we come up with the idea that uh, we think of, instead of looking at the uh, genome, can we do the protein detection? Uh, so we, if we do the protein detection, compare with the database, we would be able to do multiple virus detection per run, per, per, uh, per mass spectrometry run. So this would really uh, improve the number of viruses that we can detect it. And then also uh, this process is really routine and we don't require a lot of method development. So um, <clears throat> we tested, so we approved these concepts and then also we integrate some mass spectrometry protein detection with the cell culture so that we were able to do the infectious virus detection. And then in our assays, we use, um, so we tested with some uh, murine coronavirus. Um, so we spiked into the wastewater that we collected so we collected the, so uh, from the very beginning of the wastewater samples and also collected and treated wastewater samples. But we spiked in our model coronavirus at different um, concentrations. Um, so we trying to use the cell line and also the protein detection to see if we can detect those viruses. Because we only have one strain of these murine viruses, uh, we were not able to do the multi, uh, the multiple virus detection, uh, but we just uh, want to see if we can see the viruses. Uh, so here is we found, we did found the viral proteins. So here we found um, it's type of the intensity uh, that reported by the software. So it's the uh, intensity of these murine coronavirus nuclear proteins that we were able to detect it. And then, but we require some of the incubation times to see of the signals. Especially for those low concentration, we require really long time of incubation. Um, but I think this can be really optimized um, based on the mass spectrometry technology. So we can do more sensitive and so that you can shorten the time of the incubation. Um, then we also tested for some unknown viruses. We just want to say we have different cell lines. We have Vero and then BSC1, BGMK cell lines. What viruses we can detect it from the wastewater? So we collecting um, influent and also some of the affluent in the middle and the final affluent. We apply the wastewater to the different cell lines and then incubating for we try to get the positive results. So we just extended the incubation time for uh, two weeks and to see any viruses can be propagated in, the, in our cell systems. And then we apply um, the protein detection. So we found uh, real viruses um, in, in, all of the uh, in all of the samples that we collected. And so these are using um, some heat plots showing the protein that we detect. So these are all different proteins. And then these are the concentration represented by the color of the proteins in our, in our samples. So we see that uh, um, a basic trend is the virus, the infection virus um, inactivated throughout the wastewater treatment plant because you found uh, the protein concentration after culturing, they decrease. Um, and then, but in, in some days you will found uh, the infectious viruses in the, in the discharge. Uh, we thought it's probably because it's a real virus, even though they're not causing uh, really severe disease, uh, they're, cause they're a double strand RNA. 
And our treatment plan is using the UV, uh, which is hard to break down the double strand RNA to inactivate those viruses. That's why we, we were able to see some of the infectious real virus even in the discharge. Um, and then by using our assay, uh, when we're looking at the specific protein sequences, we identify real virus type one, two, and three uh, simultaneously in our samples. And then so to summarize, uh, if we're using the cell lines and then integrated with the protein detection, we adding an, another method to our current list can be applied for environmental um, virus testing. We, um, so this assay, we're able to detect the infectious viruses. We can do multiple virus detection, but it really depends on the cell lines. Uh, for certain cell lines, they can be, uh, be infected by different viruses for, um, so that you can detect any virus that infect that cell lines. Um, for but you, uh, this method, you also uh, need some viral database, protein databases, so that you can search, um, match up with your results. Uh, for genome mutations, uh, I would say it has better tolerance for the genome mutations because sometimes uh, even one or three amino acid changing may not causing the uh, a one or two nuclear acid changing may not causing the the amino, uh, the amino acid change. And then uh, the protein detection targeting a lot of uh, peptides from the protein. Uh, if you can find any like uh, general peptides for say coronavirus, at least you can identify the, it's a coronavirus rather than poliovirus, something like that. Um, so that's uh, all the, uh, things I want to share with about my PhD. And then so for future, uh, there is a really hot topic about wastewater-based virus surveillance. Because people are thinking uh, if the infected per individuals in, from the community in the community shedding those viruses, uh, instead of looking individually, uh, the wastewater has the advantages that you can check in the community uh, how the virus outbreaks in the community <clears throat> really, really fast, uh, effectively, so you can just grab wastewater and to look at what viruses present in there. <clears throat> so in order to, <clears throat> so in order to do those surveillance, I think we definitely need to think about our future methods about virus detection. So I hope definitely hope it can be very rapid or fast detecting. And then we can either looking at infectious virus or can we can looking at the viral biomarkers like their proteins or genomes, but need a better correlate uh, the how much, and so what does the genome mean about the infectious viruses in the wastewater? And then we also want this assay, future assay be really high throughput. So high throughput are two directions. So first, um, as I did before about the protein detection, we wanted to do multiple virus detection per assay. Um, and then to do detecting as many as viruses as possible. And I also wanted to increase the capability of the sample, the wastewater sample that we can process it. So at the same time, so that we can grab uh, a lot of the wastewater samples, say, uh, uh, in in the wastewater uh, pipeline, throughout the wastewater pipeline, to better locating which uh, region or areas um, that have the highest concentration of wastewater. So we can locate some hotspots of viral infections. And also we need to think about some risk assessments. Uh, as I mentioned, say if we were, test, we were detecting viral genome, uh, what does that mean? about uh, infection, uh, risks of virus infection. And then, and then what about that mean about how many infectious viruses are there? Something like that. Um, also, because viruses are mutated very fast and then new virus emerging, um, 
our method right now, we rely on database or the PCR. We need a prior knowledge about those, their sequences, either genome sequences or protein sequences. But what if a new virus, we don't know. There's some unknown unknowns. Um, can, is there any methods that could help us to dealing with those super new or unknown viruses in the future? Um, we need to think about, also think about the false positive control, because especially for unknowns, you may be reporting some false um, signals. Um, so that's some my thinking of the, we, uh, about future virus detection. And then if you're interested in any of the application, we can collaborate in the future and then think about uh, apply those to the engineer system. Okay, so if, at the end, I want to thank you all the people who have been helped me through my PhD and the postdocs and in the funding sources. Uh, you can follow my Twitter um, to <clears throat> check some of the my app updates and also send me emails if you're very interested in any collaboration. And then if you have students want to do virus research in the future, um, Welcome to spread the spread the words. Thank you. Uh, I can. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doc Ye, for your very nice presentations. And uh, uh, now it's the Q A sections. And uh, actually, I got a questions from the from the audience. And uh, yes, from uh, from uh, from, uh, from uh, Liang Zhao. And uh, hi, Dr. Ye, uh, I'm a PhD student at Michigan State. I just have a quick question. Uh, there are some articles about detecting uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus from raw wastewater samples. And mm -hmm. thus, if the virus can be detected in the raw wastewater samples, uh, is it possible for it to transmit from wastewater into air. Uh, in other words, is it possible that the coronavirus could transmit from wastewater to air and then to infect the people who do the sampling? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Liao. Uh, so first, yes, there are a lot of uh, papers talking about SARS-CoV-2 detected in wastewater, uh, but I would uh, uh, try to bring their methods out. So they primarily, most of them, using the genome-based methods, using the PCR methods. So um, you actually don't know about the infectivity. And I also, I followed, um, followed some people trying to co-train SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater, uh, but I don't think they got uh, really good uh, results. So I would uh, Assuming that most of the SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater, they are actually in an inactivated state. Um, so we can also, so some of the, um, I think I don't, I don't remember where I read about uh, some uh, virology. A virologist suggests that uh, for normally for a thousand or to ten thousand gene copies there will be one infectious virus particles. Uh, so when you apply those ratios, calculating and comparing with the current um, viral genome concentration in the wastewater, you may just got uh, less than one infectious viruses per, I think per liter, something like that. So, um, if, so that would be really difficult for this virus causing uh, infect. Uh, causing infections. Um, but I think a, a, a study is really needed. And then also, I think it's also important to do some of uh, the wastewater air um, transmission studies uh, in case there's uh, to look to see how what's the and to see just get an idea of how much infectious viruses uh, needed in the wastewater, and then if they wanted to transmit it, how much, what percentage they can get into the air. Um, so I think these studies are also really important. Um, I think, yeah, I think I saw, 
I thought one of my friends doing this wastewater air, wastewater conversion, I don't know how to say, the wastewater and the air studies. Um, so you can look at, uh, uh, you can look at some articles from Virginia Tech, um, Dr. Lindsay Marr, and uh, her student, uh, Kaisen Ling's paper for better understanding those uh, transmission and then from the wastewater to air and then their studies. Yeah, should be very interesting. Yeah, I think I would like to uh, add some points to this question, like to, to, to answer this question as, uh, as Dr. Ye uh, introduced at the first few slides, like there are uh, virus de detected in human feces, but even from those, the infection rate is very, very low. So if the, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then from, from household to wastewater treatment plant, it's like sometimes 24 hours, sometimes more than that, or less than that, like 10 hours. So yeah. after that long time of transportation, then the, um, I think the infectious virus will be further lower down. So mm -hmm. no, var no need to worry about, um, I would say low risk, right? <laughs> yeah, right now it's, I say, um, um, would it, I would say low risk because mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see any like uh, cases being reported, um, transmitted by the wastewater and also, um, and also when you do the wastewater sampling, I would definitely suggest um, do really um, good PPE and then face masks or something and follow any um, regulations. Um, yeah, it should, yeah, it should be still be very careful even though uh, I think the risk is very low. Um, we don't know because especially during the pandemic, uh, you don't know if the, this community, maybe they have thousands of severe COVID-19 persons. Um, the, the infectious virus concentration might be high. So we still need, yeah, we still need a lot of studies and to better understand the infectivity and how they inactivate in the wastewater or something. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so anyone who has maybe has questions, uh, uh, you can either post it in the chat section or you can unmute, unmute yourself and directly interact with our uh, speaker, Dr. Ye, yeah. Yeah, I have a question, yeah. Yeah, thank you Yin, for the very, very solid fundamental works. I mean, I appreciate it very much. So um, I'm, just, I, I'm just curious, uh, there's a lot, a lot of various before, as you mentioned, right? The, a lot of various, uh, fatal various. So, uh, have you seen that cases, these various uh, uh, infect people by, you know, uh, living in the waste water? And mm -hmm. uh, how long they can live in the waste water? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how long they can live in the waste water? And uh, mm -hmm. another thing that just, um, but, uh, for, again, for my curiosity, so, um, the various, uh, I always wear my mask, but I, I just go out and I'm lazy. So next time I will wear the same mask. So I'm just wondering if these various, they can, they can live in the, in the mask for, for, for how long? I mean, and uh, if they really, they can survive in the mask. And then for example, my kid touched the mask and then there's some, some uh, risk to be infected. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Shimi, for the question. And so for the first one, you asked about any cases about uh, wastewater transmission. So for COVID-19, I didn't, I didn't see um, if anyone, I may uh, not pay attention, but uh, I think based on my current knowledge, I didn't see uh, any wastewater transmitted cases. But for SARS, for in 2003 for SARS coronavirus, there's one case um, in, in an apartment in Hong Kong, apartment complex in Hong Kong. So those were 
thought transmitted through the wastewater, uh, the fecal aerosols. So it's a, and shedding an infectious particles in the waste in a in a feces and urine, and you're flushing the toilets. You're generating some aerosols, <clears throat> and these aerosols, because those apartments are really old, um, and so they have they don't have a very good uh, how to say the trapping. So normally your toilets will have some water traps, and um, to block any aerosols in the sewer lines. So they have the damaged trapping, and then so those fecal aerosols <clears throat> gets into some of the apartment, um, causing infections. Um, this is because uh, this is also the people like living. Uh, um, uh, how to say so? Yeah, because this was this infection. Those infection cases were caused not. They don't have contact history, and just. Uh, by like, but they leave, uh, so that like they leave on different um, floors. And then, so that's the people how they're thinking that might be caused by the fecal aerosols. Um, <clears throat> for wastewater, yeah. And then that's the only cases I know about wastewater related. Um, so. How long they can survive in the wastewater? How long is the right? Yeah, so for survivability, I would have say, based on my testing uh, for those models suggesting uh, like 90% will be activated within 24 hours. Um, okay. But we, we don't know, we kind of don't <clears throat> know about based on my murine coronavirus. But uh, uh, if it, it's possible, I think it, I would have suggest doing some uh, collaborating with BL cells 3 lab and doing real SARS-CoV-2 testing in the wastewater. But I think um, it won't like a super survival, um, but you can get a really accurate data for that. Um, and then for the mask survivability, um, also there are a lot of uh, papers available right now. They testing, um, again, they're using the models of I think they're also using the real SARS-CoV-2 and a SARS coronavirus testing their survivability on masks. Um, I think, and then they're how to inactivate those viruses on masks, something like that. Yeah, I don't think I think it's not a really um, big concern for our for normal people. Like you just go outside. Um, yeah, I think it might be a different story for people working in ICU okay, okay. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, mm -hmm. um, those persons. And, mm -hmm. and also there, I think materials, like uh, um, Jen, you can look for different mask materials for better in activating the viruses when they absorb to your, to the mask. Something, yeah, there are a lot of studies going on. Let's see. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah is it, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite into this area, but I think I heard a talk, the people asking this, like similar questions, you know, wastewater, virus, how dangerous is it? And I think they mentioned some numbers that once it enters the wastewater, maybe a couple of hours. Yeah then <laughs> you don't need to worry too much because <laughs> it so, decays very fast. So they don't like the water environment? Well, there's no, like, there's no human cells in the wastewater, yeah, exactly. like, not mm -hmm. living cells in the, in the yeah. for oh, them to the grow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then, so like your wastewater may contain other bacteria or protozoa, they yeah. have yeah. Some enzymes, uh, like it may mm. damage uh, the virus um, causing the inactivation. So for human viruses, it's, uh, yeah, they can't replicate in the wastewater. So the only way they can do is just to sacrifice um, their infectivity, get inactivated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, there is another question from the audience uh, from Yun Zhou. So, uh, so Dr. Zhou is a colleague of mine and uh, because he's in China <laughs> and he had some problem to join the, fr the first few slides. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> like 3 a.m. in China. Uh, but he missed, because of the connectivity, he missed some of the slides. And he would like to ask uh, about protein in this topic. What the methods you used to, to determine different species of proteins? Does different species of protein directly related to the specific virus? Why not directly using Co-methane brilliant blue method to determine the total protein concentration. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, I can. So my method, we we just apply the wastewater to cell lines to let it replicating, and then we cover all the cell lines. So the our samples will be mixing of both cell line proteins and the viral proteins. So uh, for the Kumasi blue. Uh, they're just uh, do the total, yeah, they do the total concentration, but you won't know how much of them are from the virus, right? Um, and even there's no virus, and the cell line proteins definitely show some uh, results. Uh, and then for, so we, that's why we do the mass spectrometry uh, to, so in the mass spectrometry, when you chop those proteins into small peptides, the mass spectrometry can read the sequence of the peptides. And then by comparing the sequence that you can read from the mass spectrometry and to the database that you prepared, uh, including on different viral proteins. And then, so once they got, I'll say, oh, I did this protein, these peptides, and then let's see where these peptides are from. Are oh, these peptides from the influence of protein? And then, oh, and then you further, you can further search down oh, which strain, which type of influence of virus that have these type of this sequ this peptide sequence. And so you can further narrow down to specific virus. Uh, you can down to the species level or to strain level. Uh, if you got really unique peptide sequence detected. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's my, my method for protein detection. Uh, we are not looking at the total protein concentration. Hi, hi, Dr. Yu. Um, this is Biho speaking. Thank you so much for the talk. Again, it's really enlightening, and I especially like your illustrations of the viruses. They're very clear. Um, I actually have like a really basic question about virology. Um, I used to be a molecular biologist, molecular microbiologist as well. Um, and actually, my PhD research was very similar to yours in that our lab was isolating bacteriophages from wastewater and then trying to characterize them and study the co-evolution of these phages with their hosts. Um, so I was working on something that's similar to T4 phage, which is an on envelope phage. So I'm not really familiar with the role of these lipid membranes of um, viruses. And I was just wondering if you could give a brief introduction of their role in their um, infectability and whether anyone has done any assays to look at other methods that might be disrupting the membrane, which could affect the yeah. uh, survivability of viruses. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Biho. Uh, uh, Biho. Biho. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Biho. Uh, so for the lipids, actually, so the lipids, Mm, this is a good question. Why some they have lipids, why some not? Uh, I can't answer that question. But for the for the envelope virus, as you can see, uh, they carry some um, membrane proteins, and these membrane proteins um, kind of anchor in those lipids. They're um, they have function. So the protein has the function to attach to some of the receptor proteins in the host cell, um, on the host cells. So when they, and those, um, on, when those um, proteins, the membrane proteins attach, uh, recognize the host cells and, and then um, attach the host cell protein, the virus will just starting um, uh, merge or say, yeah, kind of uh, uh, merge their membrane 
with the host membrane and then to sending their uh, genetic materials um, and then or the, the protein core into the host cells. So the, the membrane is actually, um, so when they do the entry, uh, there are some, uh, um, there are some functions in there, like they needed to uh, merge with the uh, with a, a host membrane, and also the membrane needs to be stable in order to make sure their the the protein and the, those proteins the, those membrane proteins are stable. So your I heard I, I read some papers that people using the like high temperature. Um, during in a high temperature, the lipid membrane will be very kind of flu fluidic, something, and then so that the the proteins were just really kind of not really stable, and then so the virus just get inactivated because they can't recognize the host cells, uh, and then for the membrane disruption, it can easily use some organic solvents like uh, ethanol, uh, methanol, uh, things can easily. Um, as long as you dissolve the membrane, the virus just inactivate it because because um, those uh, those membrane proteins are really important for their entry and then kind of uh, disrupt the virus entering or recognizing the host cells. So that's why I think uh, who who has mentioned that you can using the ethanol to do the disinfection. Uh, I think during the outer, uh, early outbreak of the COVID-19. I think someone mentioned this, yeah. And also the high temperature, because you're also damaging, uh, changing the, the fluidity of those lipids and can also easily inactivate the envelope viruses. So basically envelope viruses, it's really fragile, I'd say. Yeah, wimpy and then, I would say that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for the answer. Thank That's you. very clear. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, so, uh, so if if anyone has questions, you can uh, post it in the chat and uh, or directly interact with our speaker. And don't feel shy. I mean, so everyone is very equal here. So free, you can just freely express what you want to say. Yeah. So. Uh, if don't, I actually, I, I have a question, although I'm not uh, familiar with biology, but uh, uh, because you, you showed like a, tab a, a table, like uh, uh, comparing different kind of detection method. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, but, uh, I, I was just wondering like, if there are any quantitative measurements of those, for example, sensitivity yeah. and, uh, and as such, uh, or it's just like, uh, you know, it's like a very qualitative comparison. But because yeah. I was wondering, like, in, in terms of accuracy, I'm not sure which one uh, determines the accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, uh, um, is that like a percentage? Like, uh, for example, if you detect it, it can be fa false positive and false negative. So what's the, you know, the, 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 the percentage of the, the accuracy? Accuracy, yeah. okay, yeah. so for, so for you can using the PCR method to do the quant to do the quantification. So you can reporting how many G copies. Uh, we would assume one one virus carry one gene copy. Um, okay. Then you can, and then you can just estimate how many virus particles um, measured by the PCR method. And then for for PCR method to testing whether it's a positive net false positive, you can just do some of this, the following sequencing and to see if that's the real uh, amplified genome or genes, or that's just some uh, um, noisy signals. But in most cases, PCR would give you a good genome. Um, I think it's a, really rare that you can get false negative. Because we oh. have some other testing uh, right after the PCR uh, to see if that is the if that is the input if that signal is coming from the genes. Um, oh. The only thing that you may like uh, targeting different targets. So if you have 
not very good PCR assay, you may amplify other genes, not your target genes. Um, false, yeah, that's false positive. So you need a double checking about um, with sequencing method or with other um, checking how the, the length that you expected the genes, something you can check in later on. Um, then the, for the cell culture assay also give you some quantitative results. So there, um, so it's reporting how many infectious units, either by plaques, uh, like we do plaque forming units or the uh, focus forming units. So these are just to quantify how many infectious particles present in, in your sample. Uh, typically for virus, uh, not every virus is infectious. So if, if you got, say, if you got gene copies, if you got, for PCR, you're detecting a thousand gene copies per mil, which um, typically mean you have a thousand virus particles, but maybe one out of thousand can form, uh, can in infect the cell lines. So if you apply the same store, uh, stock to the cell line, you may just got one platforming units. So there, there, yeah. So virus is uh, just a, there's some story here. And then for, for the um, protein detection, mm -hmm, and yeah, the, the one that I used, it's not quant quantitative actually, mm -hmm. it's qualitative. Um, for protein, if you wanted to quantify, uh, you need to apply other mass spectrometry technology. Uh, you need to um, purchase some internal standards because um, based on in your internal standard concentration, you can um, report what's your target concentration. And, but it's still reporting in like a, um, in protein concentration, typically like a molar or gram protein, something like that. Um, yeah. It's not like a, but you can also, again, protein. So for one, so for, um, for some of the virus, you know, like how many protein copies in that virus. And then say, if you, if you, um, then you can convert in the protein concentration to protein copies and then convert to how many viruses. So some of the, uh, but they're quantitative results. Um, that's, that's what I want to do in the future. I want to do protein quantification and then linking that to how many virus particles, something like that. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, great. So, is there any, so, anyone else? No? Okay, yeah. yeah. So, adding on that part, that question, that's why, because um, there are, there may be um, false negative, um, no, sorry, false positive, like the PCR, if, if, if not optimized, it may um, amplify other genes. Is that why in the table that the, both the PCR related methods need a lot of <laughs> optimization? But I think once it's optimized, yeah. um, the accuracy is quite good, right? Yeah, yeah, once it's optimized. So right now when people are doing COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, uh, so the CDC has suggested methods. So I think that for most of the paper I saw, they would have uh, um, using, if they want to develop their own methods, they will definitely uh, compare with the CDC methods. Um, yeah, so that's, but uh, the first assay will take a time to develop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there are already papers on um, detection from the from the waste, uh, wastewater samples uh, yeah. using. Yeah, PCR, for right uh, yeah, for right yeah. now, uh, right now the focus is not to looking at how many infectious SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. in the wastewater. So right now the focus is just to, to looking at the gene levels and try to linking the gene levels to the prevalence of virus infection. Because yeah. for example, you have 50% of people shedding. Um, and then if you're looking at it, what's the range of the shedding concentration uh, mm -hmm. of the genes. 
and then you get into the wastewater, uh, and then you um, you detecting what levels of in the wastewater, and you can calculate it back how many people are shedding these viruses, and then to estimate how many people were infected by the SARS-CoV-2 in the community. So that's the um, one uh, focus for current, um, for current so for most of the surveillance wastewater-based epidemiology work for SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, uh, I think we still have time for one more questions. And uh, if anyone has questions, please, please uh, go ahead. And uh, if don't, then we can just conclude today's talk. Yeah, just uh, wait for 10 seconds for if anyone has questions. Okay, okay, I guess, uh, cool. yeah, I guess uh, everyone, yeah. So I, I, I think it's not the time to conclude our today's talk and uh, it's very nice to see uh, in like, uh, you yeah, know, we after <laughs> Uh, okay. We haven't met like face to face for like uh, for twelve years. I mean, now it's the yeah, yeah. It's really something. It's really something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, thanks a lot for for your, for your talk. It's really nice of you. And uh, so yeah, let's meet in next week. Uh, and uh, and uh, in the next episodes of the the talk. Yeah, thanks everyone for participation. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, bye. Bye.